Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What are the course requirements? You need a computer and internet connection to follow along with this course. Who is this course for? This course is for anyone who wants to learn something new. What is the course format? The format of the course is video. Hello and welcome to this video on what is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language. This means it can be used to write computer programs for various things like games, data science, websites, and so on. Python is also a high level programming language. High level programming languages mean that the languages of writing computer instructions in a way that is easily understandable and close to human language. Python is portable, which means we can run Python programs in the various different operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, Linux, without any changes. Python is an interpreted language. Python is called an interpreted language because it goes through an interpreter, which turns code you write into the language understood by your computer's processor. Python is strongly typed. Strongly typed languages don't convert data from one type to another type automatically. Python has a huge set of libraries. A Python library is a collection of programs you can incorporate into your own program without writing code for them. Let's take a look at a list of application types you can create with Python. Web applications. These are applications you can access using a web browser. Android applications. These are applications that runs on Android devices like Android phones and tablets games. You can create various types of games with Python. Scientific applications. You can create various types of scientific applications with Python. System administration applications. So you can use Python to create applications to monitor various types of systems. You can also create console applications. A console application basically is a computer program designed to be used by a text only computer interface. Let's take a look at a list of software applications that have been created using Python. So some of these are quite famous and popular. First on the list is YouTube, and then we have Google, we have Dropbox. This program lets you save files to a cloud-based service that you can then access from anywhere in the world. We've also got Reddit. Reddit is one of the biggest open communities on the web. You have a question you want to talk about something in specific, or if you want to find tons of information regarding a particular topic, uh, for example, gardening or anything, you can just look on Reddit and find related information. Next, we have Spotify. Spotify allows you to listen to ad free music of your choice. 
It's a streaming service that allows you to stream music without any advertisement. Finally, we've got Instagram. Instagram is very popular. It has both an app side and also a website as well. And these are just a few list items of software that were created using Python. There are so many others, but these are just some few that you may have come across. So that is it for this video on what is Python. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I will be showing you how to install Python on a Windows 10 computer. This is the official Python website. So if we go to the Downloads tab, we can see that as of the time I am recording this video, the current version is Python 3.9.0. You can download and install Python directly from this Python website. However, there is a more cleaner way to install Python as an app using the Microsoft Store. All right, so you can go to Microsoft Store. That is how I'm going to install it in this video. This is a cleaner way to install Python. It handles auto updates and can be uninstalled easily. It does not update the path variable in a way that breaks other application. To begin, let's check that our Windows 10 system is fully up to date. So to do that, you click on the start button here and click on this icon, which is the settings tab to take you to the settings menu. So from the settings menu, select update and security. And if your system is up to date, it will tell you, as you can see, mine says, I am up to date. So make sure your system is fully up to date. If it's not, you can check for updates and then run any updates that are available. Next, let's go to the Microsoft store. So in the search bar on the bottom here, just type in store and it will bring up Microsoft store. So click on the Microsoft store. When the Microsoft store launches, click on the search bar here. And in the search bar, just type in Python. Once you've typed in Python in the search bar, just press enter. And that will show you a list of Python available. So we are going to go for this one, which is Python 3.9. You can see it is free. So I'm going to click on it. You will then see the install button. So click on the install button to begin. You need to sign in if you've got a Microsoft account. So make sure you sign in with your email. Once you have signed in, you can see the download has started. When the installation is completed, you get this message that says this product is installed and it'll ask you if you want to pin it to the start. So if you want to pin it to the start of your programs, you can do that. Okay. So I'm just going to exit this interface to check Python has been installed. If you click on your start menu and you can see we've got Python here listed. Okay. So that indicates that Python has been installed on your system. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install Python on a Windows 10 computer. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install Python 3 on a Mac OS. Historically, Mac OS comes pre-installed with Python version 2. However, starting with the Mac version 10.15, which was released in October 2019, this is no longer the case. So Python 2 is no longer supported officially as from January the 1st, 2020. 
So if you still got Python 2, it's time to install Python version 3. There are multiple ways to install Python 3 on a Mac OS computer. The official Python websites recommends downloading it directly. However, this approach can cause confusion around path variables. Also, it can be difficult to update and sometimes difficult to uninstall. In my opinion, a better approach is to use the popular package manager called Homebrew to install Python version 3. Homebrew can automate updates and it can also juggle multiple versions of Python on the computer. So we're going to use Homebrew to install Python. So the first thing we need to do is open up the terminal. So here on the dock, I've got my terminal. So I'm just going to double click. If you haven't got your terminal on the dock, you can click on the launch pad. And in the launch pad search, just type in T, then select to click on the terminal, just double click, and that will launch the terminal. So the first thing we want to do is to check the version of Python we have installed. And to do that, you type in the word Python. You do a space, two dashes, dash, dash, and type in the word version. Once you've typed in version, hit enter on your keyboard, and that will return the version of Python you have. So as you can see, I have got Python version 2. 0.7.10. So I'm going to install Python version 3 using Homebrew. So to install Python version 3 using Homebrew, we type in the command brew space install space Python 3. I've typed in the command here, brew space install space Python 3 and just hit enter and that will install Python version three on your Mac. So I'll give it a few minutes to run through the installation. So Python three has been installed successfully. Anytime you want to refer to Python three, you have to type in Python three because you have Python two and Python three on your machine. So to check that you have Python 3 installed, you type in Python 3 space dash dash version. So Python 3, you do a space and then two dashes, dash dash, and type in the word version and press enter and that will return the current version of 3. So it tells you you have Python 3.9.0. So that's the recent version of Python. So when you refer to Python 3, you always have to type in Python 3. If you type in just Python, it will refer to Python 2. Also, anytime you want to install any Python 3 package, you have to use the command pip3, because if you use pip, pip will refer to Python version 2. PIP is a package manager that enables you to install Python packages. And when you install Python, you also have PIP bundled with Python. So in order to distinguish the version of PIP you are using to install Python packages, you have to specify that you're using PIP3, which will refer to Python 3 packages. If you just use PIP, it will refer to Python version 2. To exit your terminal, just click on the terminal and select quit terminal. So that is it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to install Python 3 on a Mac using Homebrew. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the Python idle. 
the idol stands for interactive development environment it is an environment that you can use for learning it consists of two main windows the edit window and the shell window i have heard people say that the idol was also taken from eric idol which is one of the members of the monty python comedy group it's a british comedy group their name was used to name the python programming language so the group as a group is called monty python and there is a guy a member of the group called eric idol some people say the idol was named after him i'm not sure but that's what some people say so that's a, that's an image of the monty python group and that's eric there eric idol this is a more maybe recent picture of the eric idol so some people say the idol is named after him let's have a look at what the idol looks like so go to your start if you are on a windows computer go to start all programs you should see the python 3.5 if you click on that you should see the idol there so just click on the idol and it should load up so this is what the python idol looks like it consists of two main window the edit window and then the shell so this is the main shell this is where you would experiment when you are writing python code it is a useful learning environment whereby you're writing if you're writing little chunks of code is interactive so you can see the output straight away the other window is the edit window so to access it you go to file and go new file and so this is what the edit window looks like so when it opens up initially it has the label untitled but when you save it with a name then that changes you can see there is a slight difference in the menu options of both windows both of them have got file edit if you notice this one the shell has got the shell it's got a debug debug is a way of testing out your code it's got options windows and help so this has got the run here so the menus are slightly different within both windows i'm just going to minimize the edit window for now so we can focus on the python shell the python shell is an interactive window and it acts as an interpreter so it will interpret what you type into a format the computer can understand so when you've got this this three um, sign here that looks like right angles if you've got these signs there it tells you that the python shell is waiting for a command so it's waiting for you to do something and it will respond so let's do some basic maths so let's do three plus four and then if you click on enter on your keyboard you should get the result there you go three plus four give you seven let's do a minus this time i'll do six minus four and click on enter it gives me two let's do a times this time i do nine times six the times in python is represented by the asterisk symbol so if you click enter it will give you the output so these are just 
basic arithmetic calculations that you can perform using Python inside the idle using the Python shell. The Python shell is referred to as the interactive mode. It's mainly used for testing, learning and trying small things very quickly where you can see a response. The edit window on the other hand is used mainly for scripting where you want to script or write proper code that will do something very useful and a code that you can save and run later. If you want to do that, you would be using the edit window, which is this screen here. So this is where you would write your proper code or instructions for the computer to follow. And then when you save the file, you save it with a .py extension. So something like if you write in hello computer or something like that, you, when you are writing text, in computer language, you need to surround it with quotes so that the computer can understand. So if I was to save something like this, you save it as, I'll save it, for example, save it on my desktop and I'll just save it as hello.py. py is the extension for python so that's the that's it saved there as a dot py extension so if you want to write proper code to do stuff you be use best to use the edit window and then you can save your files you can also run the python shell from within the edit window by going run and then python shell this was the simple hello I wrote in Python and saved. So this is how your files will look like when you're saving from the edit window. In this lecture, we had a look at the Python idle, which is an integrated development environment that you can use for learning. It consists of two main windows where you can work from the edit window that you can use to write proper code, Python code, and then the interactive shell window where you can experiment and write little chunks of code. Thank you so much for your time. I hope the video has been useful. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. This is going to be a two part video where we are going to create a digital clock using Python from scratch. The first thing you need to do is open up the Python shell and you can access the shell via the Python folder. So if you go to your programs menu and inside the Python folder, just click on this. That is a Python idle and that will open up the shell. Once you've got the shell open, we need to open up a new file. So you click file and click new file. So this new file here is where we will actually write the program and any errors that occur will be displayed in the shell. We are going to use a few Python libraries. So we need to import them before we use them. The first library we're going to import is the tkinter library. Um, so we need to import that by typing in from in lowercase space and then the word tkinter space import and then asterisk and this will import the tkinter library so it's available for us to use so it's the first line you have to put in if you are going to use the tkinter in your program tkinter is a library that is used to build user interfaces or interfaces in general so we're going to import a sub library also from tkinter 
so we say from tick enter this one is going to be called ttk next we're going to import the font we want to use a font tick enter also has fonts you can use so we'll do tick enter import font next we are going to import the time module because we need to use that to import time next thing i'm going to do is import a module for date time we're going to make reference to that so that's it we've got all our libraries next we want to create a function so def is what you use to define a function and i'm going to call this function quit so we'll use this to quit the application and i'm going to pass in the arguments args and colon next we'll type in root dot destroy inside the function we've just defined we've got an asterisk followed by the word args uh, basically what that is used for is used inside function definitions and it's used to pass a non keyworded variable length so it will allow you to pass key non keyworded variable length arguments as a list kind of like an array so it allows you to pass several arguments provided they are not keywords keywords sometimes are reserved for the program so you can actually use them next we've got the root dot destroy method what this will do it will cause the main loop to exit so when you at the end of the day when you close the window for the application that's the method that will trigger the application to close it will just close the session the next thing we're going to do is create an another function this will be for our clock so we're going to say df i'm going to call it clock underscore time you can call it whatever you want it doesn't really matter so i'm just calling it clock all right and you put a colon after that next thing i want to do is define a variable so i'm going to call the variable time and i am going to set this variable to equals to the date time don't forget we imported the date time so we can use it now so i'll do date time dot date time dot now which will give us to the current time the date dot time method returns the current time also in milli milliseconds so i want to avoid that so to do that i'll need to format the time using a special format function so to do that i've got to reference the time variable again and i'm going to have to set that to equals to and i'll wrap it round the variable dot this is a special function here it's called strf time this is used to it's a function used to format the time based on the arguments you've passed in so i'm going to enclose that in double quotes and i'll pass in the format i want so i want the hour a colon and i want the minute I put colon and I want the seconds and I close the double quotes close the parentheses and close the other parentheses next thing I want to do is find a way to display our time so we're going to do text 
say txt which is text we're going to set that to equals to the time variable so there is a function on method called set dot text dot time which text dot set so this is a method and we're passing in this time variable here as the value next we want to trigger the clock so that it starts after every one millisecond so we do root dot after and inside parentheses we pass in the milliseconds a comma and then we pass in the function which is the clock clock on the score time so that's it so we'll end this video here and in part two we will um, continue so thanks for watching and bye for now hello and welcome to the part two of creating a digital clock using python in this part we are going to build the user interface so we start by typing in root and we set that to equals to tk the tk basically creates the root everything that you put on your screen whether it is a text box a button or an image is known as a widget and they must all be placed in the root so the root is kind of like a basket that um, you put all your widgets in so let's add some more to this root next thing i want to do is set the attribute so i'll do root dot attributes and inside parentheses i'm going to specify the attributes so i'm going to set the value for full screen if you want your application to display in full screen then you set the value to true when it's full screen you can't it's hard to resize it so i'm going to set that to false but if you want yours to be full screen where it can't be resized then you can set it to true i would you know just play around with it and see but set it to false because it will make it easier for you to resize it to your taste i want to set the background color for the clock i want to set it to black so you do root dot configure configure and then in parentheses you type in the word background and you set it to whatever color you want i'm going to set it to black so i type in black make sure you always match up your quotes next thing i want to do i need you to be able to click on the x button you can see this x here i want to create one for the application so that you can exit when you click that so i'll do root dot bind so i'm going to bind i'm going to bind this function here called quit so i'll wrap that in parentheses so i'll attach a label called x and that x i'm going to also pass in the function called quit so this root dot bind will take in two arguments this value x and then quit this is the function i've already defined i'm going to trigger the clock again to start to so do root dot after every milliseconds i want the clock to start so we'll call the clock underscore function which is clock underscore time and that will trigger the clock to start i've 
add call this variable this here and I'm setting that to a string variable function. In order to save time, I have um, completed the code. So let me just go through what I have added on. So here I've created a variable called FNT and set that to equals to font dot font. So basically I'm using the, I specify the font family here called Helvetica and I've set that the size of the font to be 120. Um, the weight, that means I want it to be bold. And here I have defined this text txt variable and I've set that to equals to a string var. What this means is that this will hold a string value by default, okay? And here I am using the this LBL, it's a label variable, and I'm using referencing this TTK, which is a sub module of Tkinta. So here is where we are setting the properties for the clock. So we're setting the background, which is the foreground color of the clock, is going to be white while the background of the actual clock, the text, is going to be black. This is different from this. This is this relates to the screen. This we are just setting these properties here. These settings are for the actual window, while these ones here are for the actual clock itself. The text that the clock displays, that's what these settings are for. That's the foreground color and that's the background color and this here is used to anchor it to the center here i've used the relics and the rely basically these are geometric um, functions in t kinta you basically use them to give a position that is relative to the window while the anchor here is used to actually center the widget. Finally, on this line here, we've got the root dot main loop. This basically handles the T inter event loop. So basically it keeps the application or the clock running until the window is closed. So that is it. So the clock is basically built. Um, what I would advise you to do is make sure you format. Um, there's options here to format. You can indent. Make sure your indentation is like mine because um, this editor is quite very fussy. So if you don't indent things properly, it will complain. So make sure your indentation is spot on. If you get any errors, Usually the arrows will be on this side in the shell. Um, just response to it. Okay, so I'm just going to click save. Now I want to run the clock so you can run it by just going run and click run module and that will open up the clock. So hopefully everything should be okay. So this is it. So if you had this set to full screen then it will take over your entire screen um, but doing it this way you can resize it to whatever size you want and it's more it's a more flexible approach okay if you want there's different formats if you want to add the actual date to this um, i have um, also created a line of code but i commented it out so let me just close this this line of code here, um, I've commented it out, this one here. So this allows you, this will, you can see the format here. This will di display both the date and the time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to comment this out. If you want to comment something in Python, you do that using the hash symbol. It's very useful, it enables you to try things out. All right, so I'm going to use a different format here for the time. So it's going to give me both the date and the time. So I'm going to click save. 
and I'll run this so you can see the difference and this should hopefully show let me just expand that so you can see it's quite big okay I probably need to reduce so you can see it shows both because I've got it so big um, that's why it's covered the screen all right what I need to do let me just reduce I'll close that call me where I've got the size of the font I'll just reduce that to 60 because the screen has more to contain and I'll run that again the screen should be smaller now and you should be able to see everything so you can see that so if you prefer this format of the clock that's fine then what you need to do is use this code here okay um, if you don't want that you don't need this I'll just get rid of that um, this is just I don't need that anymore this was just a comment okay so I just tab up all right so if you decide you only want to show the time you don't want the date then you comment this line out and use this line instead I prefer just the time at the moment so I'm going to comment this out I don't want the date but it's good to have the option so that you can choose which format you like so I'll go back to the format I chose um, since I've got less text to display I'm going to increase the font size to 120 so that it appears big on the screen I'll save that run that again run the module and that is it yep I prefer this format okay make sure you save your work always save it so when you save you go to click save as and I've saved mine as digital clock dot py py is the Python extension okay save any way you like I've saved mine on the desktop okay so that's it that's the end of this um, project for the digital clock I hope it's been useful if you do have any problems please feel free to contact me thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this video in this video I'll be showing you how to run your Python application when you create a Python app you usually have to save it with a .py extension so for example this is a Python app you can see it's got a .py extension so if you wanted to run this program all you had to do is double click on it that's one way so when you double click it gives you two windows you need to have two windows because one of them is the one of them will start the application which is the py.exe and this window is the actual application so what you need to do is minimize the one that says py.exe this one here that says py.exe that's the one you need to minimize and then this will become the application okay so this will be the actual application while you've got the the dot exe running in the background this is what powers the application so you must have it in the background just minimize it so that's one way the other way you can run it through the python idle so you go to start all programs and look for your python folder inside there you've got the python idle click on that and this is the Python idle so while you're in the idle you can open this any Python file that's got a .exe extension with a py so I can browse to this from the idle by going open so by browsing to this I have now opened it in another window so this is the actual code that runs the application so to run it you can have the python shell open so if there's any errors any issues 
it will show in the editor in the Python shell. So you can just click run and click on run module. Okay, so while the module is running, you can minimize your shell and just let the application run. All right, so those are the two main ways you can run your Python application. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. This video is going to be the part one of a series of videos on creating a calculator with Python. The first thing you need to do is open up the Python shell. So the way you access it is via the Python folder. So if you go into your programs file, there's a Python folder and just click on the idle and that will launch the shell. So once you've got the shell open, we need to open up a new file. So we'll click on file, new file. And this file here is where we will write the code that will build the calculator. The first thing I'll recommend you do is save this file, save it as a Python file. So you do save as, and then give it whatever name you want. It's already got the Python file format here, so you don't need to worry about that. Just give it a name. I'm going to call mine calculator. Calculator. And I just press save and that will save it. I want it to save on my desktop. So I click save. So this file now is now a Python file. The first thing I want to do is import a library. Um, the library I want to import is called tkinter. It's a library used to generate or create graphical user interface. So to do that, we need to import it. So you type in from, then you specify the name of the module. So this is a module, it's called tkinter space, and type in the word import space asterisk, and that will import the library into the application for me to use. The next thing I want to do is create a class. A class basically is a template for creating objects. So I type in class, followed by the name I want to give the class. So I'll call it application. And when you create a class, you can also pass in arguments or parameters into it. And I'm going to pass in a frame as an argument into that class. And when you create a class, you also have to put a colon there. So this will be the main class for the calculator. Notice I've passed in frame there. A frame basically um, is used to group and organize other widgets. So it's kind of like a container object for all the widgets the application is going to use. So inside this class, I'm going to create a function or a method. So to define a function, you type in the word DEF followed by the name. So I'm going to use the init. So you do underscore init underscore and then in parentheses is where I'll pass in the any arguments I want inside that function. This underscore init underscore function is a special function that is called when an instance of a class is created. So you use that to initialize that instance. So inside the parentheses, I'm going to pass in two arguments. I'm going to pass in a self variable and master. The self is a reference to the current instance of the class. Okay, that's what that self is. And then the master represents the parent widget. So now let's initialize the frame. So to initialize the frame, we're going to use a special built-in function. And the built-in function is called super. So inside the parentheses, I'll pass in some. The super function is a built-in function which returns 
a proxy object to delegate method calls. So it uses that to delegate method calls to a class which can either be a parent or a sibling in nature. So inside the super function, I passed in the application class here and also a reference to the self variable. And here I'm using the underscore init again to initialize the master widget. This master also is known as the parent widget. So we're initializing it here. To save time, I've added a few lines of code here. So I've added these lines of code. So the self again is a variable. That it's a reference to an instance of a class or an object that is created. So here I'm setting this to blank. And then here I'm using the self again dot user input. This is going to be a user input variable. And I've set that to equals to the string var. Basically this string var is going to hold a string. And the default value is blank, but I've set this to make sure it holds a string value. Then here we've got the greet method. The grid method basically is used to register a widget with the grid geometry manager. So if you don't do this, the widget will exist internally, but it will not be visible on the screen. So the grid is used to register widgets with the geometry manager. The geometry manager is used to manage the placement and the layout of the elements of the GUI. The create underscore widget function, which we'll use to create widgets. So that's it for this part. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to part two of creating a calculator with Python. In this part, we are going to focus on creating all the buttons for the calculator. So we're going to create a function and within that function, we'll create the buttons for the calculator. So let's create a function that will um, be responsible for creating our buttons for the calculator. So to create a function, you do df space followed by the name. So I'm going to call it create. I'm going to use this here, create underscore widgets. So there will be widgets. And I am going to pass in self, the self variable into that function. And inside this function is where we define the various buttons. The user input is going to be stored as an entry widget. So inside this function, this create function, we are going to make reference to the entry widget. To save time, I have added some line of code here to the function that I created. So here we've got a reference to the self variable dot user underscore input. And we're setting this to equals to entry. The, this refers to the entry widget. The entry widget is basically used to accept single line text strings from a user. If you want to display multiple lines of text um, that can be edited, then you need to use a text widget instead. If you want to display one or more lines of text that cannot be modified by the user, then you should consider using a label widget. So here we're using an entry widget to accept a single line text strings of input from the user. And here we pass in it. This is the background color. BG refers to background color. And this is a hex value I've given it. You don't have to use hex value. You can just type in the color you want. If it's brown, white, but enclose it in quotes. 
and here we're referring to the border bd stands for border so the default value is usually in pix in pixels so i'm setting the value here to 29 so this will be the size of the border and the value is in pixels and here we're inserting the width we're setting the width to 4 so there's a difference between the insert width and the actual width the insert width basically is the width of the insertion cursor so it references the height um, so its height is determined by the tallest item in its line and the default value is usually 2 pixels but I've set it to 4 and here the width the width basically refers to the width of the widget in characters not pixel value and it's usually measure, measured according to the current font size and here we've got a reference to the font so the font I've specified to use is Vardana when you specify values you need to enclose them in quotes if they are text or string values and this 20 here refers to the size of the font bold means I want it to be bold here we've got a text variable here which I'm setting to equals to the self variable dot user input and I'm using the justify here to justify its position to the right and here we we are using a grid method for the input and this is the column span for the grid and on the screen of the calculator it, we are setting a default value of zero so the calculator will have zero on the screen as a default so i have now added a function a value here this is for the button so i've started this is the code for the button here so this is going to be the number seven button on the calculator so this is the piece of code i've got for it so here again we're referring to it as button one dot self this will be the variable and i'm setting that to equals to button and inside this button method we've got reference to the bg which is a background color i've given it this as a background color and that is the border i've set the border size to 12 usually it will be in pixel values text this is a text that will appear on the button it will have number seven on it this padx refers to external x padding so this dimension is added to the left and the right outer or outside of the widget of the widget so the dimension you apply to the left and the right outside of the widget so that's what you use for the padx so this is the value i've given it and next to it we've got paddy paddy basically is for external y padding why this refers to the padding on the x-axis this paddy y refers to a padding on the y-axis so it's basically external padding and the dimension is added to padding above and below the widget and here we've got the font i've set the value of the font to helvetica and the size is 20 and i've made it bold here we've got command we set that to lambda lambda basically is an anonymous function so it's a keyword used to describe an anonymous function so here we've got a self button dot click we've not defined this method yet but we are attaching it to this here so later once we create the button um, and write the once we write the function this for this button dot click when someone clicks on the numbers number seven button it will fire off the logic inside this button dot click method 
and here we have got a grid um, with row of two the row number basically this refers to the row number into which you want to insert the widget so the counting starts from zero and the default is the next higher numbered of unoccupied row so it basically refers to where you want to insert the widget and I've said I want to insert it after the second row the column number uh, basically refers to where you want the widget to be gridded where you want the grid to apply this column here okay I've set it to equals to zero which is the default I've also set the button here with a value of sticky um, sticky basically this option determines how to distribute any extra space within the cell that is not taken up all by the widget so any extra space that the widget doesn't occupy is um, sorted out using this sticky so it will distribute the extra spaces if you do not provide a sticky attribute the default behavior is to center the widget in the cell so I've given it a value of W what that will do it will stretch the widget both horizontally and vertically to fill the cell so this button is the number seven all the rest of the buttons are going to be identical so what I'm going to do I'm just going to copy this piece of code here and just change the relevant button um, number so I've added the other buttons that the calculator will need so this was the one we did together number seven so basically the code is the same all I've done I've just changed the text number so this will now be button number eight and this will be button number nine this will be button number four this will be button number five this will be button number six so let me scroll down so you can see the other buttons this is text button number one say this is two three and zero this will be the addition button this will be the subtraction button and this will be the multiplication button and this is the division the division is you you do division with a slash that's how you identify division in python so you use a slash most programming languages actually you use the slash to indicate a division and also i've got the equals to button so when you do the calculations you want an equals to button so this is the equals to button here and i've also got a clear button which i'm calling i'm going to have the text set as ac so you can clear what's on the screen so that is all our buttons that we're going to need for the calculator so that's it for this lecture thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to the part three of creating a calculator with python before we carry on from where we we'll stop i just want us to quickly look at the code we have so far so we started off creating a class then we have a few functions here we created a functions called underscore in it and we initialized the um, frame so the master here basically is the main window of the application we had created a class called widgets and here we have the different buttons created as widgets so most of the code within the buttons are the same the equals to button this is the equals to button here here we have where we've got the sticky set the sticky to equals w we've got the column span to two normally when a widget occupies one cell 
in the grid. Um, you can also grab multiple cells of a row and merge them into one larger cell by setting the column span option to equals to the number of cells. So we've used the column span here. And also here we've used a command. Uh, notice we didn't use lambda there. Um, here we've used a command and we've set that to self.clear display. What this would do when you click on the clear button, it will clear the display on the screen. So that's what that will do. Also here we used the self.task and we've set that to blank. Um, basically a task is a subclass of future, of a future. A future basically is an object that is supposed to have a result in the future and the task is a subclass of that future. So let's go ahead and create a few more methods of function. During the creation of the buttons, we used, we attached it to the button.click method, which we haven't created. So I've now created it here and the button.click method here. So it takes in the cell variable and the number that the user inputs into the calculator. So here, this is the logic. So we're doing the, the task.self. We're setting that to str.self. This here is a special string class, str. And inside the parameters here, we've got inside the parentheses, the self.task plus the str and then the number. str is a special string function class. Okay, and here again we're using the user dot, we're using the self variable dot the user in, and we are setting that to this, the self dot task. So this is for the button click methods. So when they click on the um, button, it will kick off this logic inside this code here. So take note that this str we have used is a Python built-in string class. It's a string class, um, which is a built-in function, uh, sorry, built-in class in Python. It's a built-in class called str. It's a string, built-in string class called str. I've created another function here called calculate task. Again, I passed in the self variable here and this function, I've also attached some error handling. Python allows you to implement errors and exceptions to be handled by your program. So it allows your programs to handle errors and exception. Uh, in order to do that, you need to use both the try and the accept statement. So here is my try statement, and this is what I've specified. And here is the statement for my accept. So this try and the accept are there to handle any errors in the application. So basically what this is doing here, this function here, um, any data that is passed into that variable um, we, it's going to be the use, it's going to be any input. So it's taking the input, it's getting the input from the user and then passing it into this variable here. And it will catch any errors here using this try. Um, so if the answer, if the answer if we evaluates to equals to that, it will, it will display. If there's not, if there's any error, the error will be captured. Okay, so this here is used to display the text of the answer. And this will, this also self.answer will display any task that's been um, inputted. And here it's a syntax that will capture any invalid syntax you enter or any error messages, it will be captured there. I've added two other functions here. This one here called display text and passed it the self and then the value that the user inputs. So again, this is what it will do. 
um, you take in the input from the user and if you decide to delete or delete your entry these are the parameters it would take and if you're inserting it would this is a code that will handle the insert again this is a function this here this function is responsible for displaying the text this function here is responsible for clearing the display okay uh, so any input you enter here you can clear it using this piece of code there so here in this bottom here i've added this here so we're setting the calculator to equals to this tk method which we um, specified earlier on the tk root so we are here this was this title we're using that to set the title for the calculator and this is what we'll call it okay this tk here is a root so we're saying that the root of the application will be the calculator and app the app here is refers to the application name this is the name of the application it's called calculator this here you use that to make the window a fixed window so the window cannot be resized okay so hence i'm setting the height to force so you cannot resize the window of the calculator because of this line of code here and this is the main loop of the calculator this is the event loop this is what keeps the calculator running until you exit the calculator so that should be it so i'm just going to click save so let's do a quick review of our code make sure the code is also formatted properly if your code is not formatted properly and you try to run it um, it can cause syntax errors and the editor will complain so make sure you've got it structured the way i've structured mine i've also added some comment here so anything you see here in green here these are all comments when you run the application the comments are ignored okay so these are comments and also this here is a comment anyway you see the hash symbol is also a comment okay so these are all comments it just helps give you a description of what we've done here so this tells you here that this is the main class for the calculator it tells you here we are initializing the frame here we're creating all the buttons for the calculator here the user input we're storing them as an entry widget here is the button for value number seven in here we've got value number eight so these are all comments anything you see a pound sign is a comment and so on so i've commented out just put a comment before each line so you know what to do okay so make sure your code is formatted this way in here there is a format option to indent your code so if you know it's not indented properly uh, make sure you do that so that the editor doesn't complain so you notice within the functions you see where the function is created and then the other actions the logic inside the function there's indentation you can see that even with a class you can see the class the indentation from the class and the methods if i scroll down you can see the indentation also okay you see how it's all indented all the logic is indented underneath the respective methods okay so make sure it's all sorted and structured in this way so once you've done that you just click and save and let's try and run the application so we'll click run and do run module hopefully yep okay that's good so this is the application here let's see if we can do some calculation so that's eight times eight that's 64 we'll clear that nine plus nine 18 we we'll clear that five 56 minus eight we we'll clear that so all the what one have we not used let's do a division we do 82 divided by six 
Okay, clear that. 9 divided by 3, clear that. So we've got all the buttons and the functionality working properly. So this concludes the series on creating a calculator with Python. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. This is going to be a three part video series where we're going to create a countdown timer using Python. Countdown timers are very useful. Um, you can use that to count down to several events, for example, holidays and other related events that are of interest to you. To begin our development, you need to open up the Python shell and you can access it via your programs menu. Inside the Python folder, there is the idle. Just double click on the idle and that will open up this shell. So once you've got the shell open, we need to open up a new window. So you go file, new file, and inside this area here is where we'll develop our application. So the first thing you need to do is save the file. So you do file, save as, and you can save it anywhere you like, but just save it with, with um, a dot py extension. Actually, you don't need to because it's already done that for you here. All you need to do is give it a name. So I'm going to call mine count down and I'll just save it in I'll save it on my desktop. Okay. That's it. So I've got the file. So this now is a Python file. I want to use some Python libraries. So before I use them, I need to import them. I'm going to import tkinter, which is a module that is used to create user interfaces of various types. So to import that, I just need to type in from space tkinter Kinter. I can't spell today. Kinter. That's it. From T Kinter. Then you type in the word import space asterisk. So with the asterisk, it will import the library. Next, we want to import another library. It's also a subset of tkinter to do to tkinter space import space this one's called ttk next we want to import a tkinter font so we can use a font from tkinter you type in the word import followed by what you're importing. So we're importing the font element. Next, I want to import the time module. So I just type in import time. Also want to import the date time. So I type in import date time. All right, so I've got all my libraries and class methods ready. First thing I want to do is create a variable. It's going to be a global variable. A global variable means it will be available throughout the application. Python variables are scope based, so you can have a variable that is local or exists only within the module. But by declaring it global, that means I want it available throughout the application. So I just type in the word global followed by the name I want to call it. I'm going to call it end time. So we'll use that later in the application. So I want to create our first function here. And to create a function, you type in df followed by the name. I'm going to call this count underscore wait. That's going to be the name of my function. 
actually before I create that function I want to create another one first I want to create a function called quit this will allow us to quit the application and inside the parentheses I'm going to pass it arguments okay and that's it and semicolon you use the asterisk and the ARGS which stands for argument so what you normally do when you are not sure how many arguments might be passed to your function um, you use the asterisk and X what that does it allows you to pass an arbitrary number of arguments to your function and inside this quit function I'm going to add a root method so I'm going to say root dot destroy and what the root dot destroy does it will cause the main loop of the application to exit so when the application keeps running and this fun with this function or this method is called it will exit the application from the loop one more thing I want to do before we wrap up this video lecture I want to create another function this time I'll call it can't underscore wait but feel free to call yours whatever you like and then the parentheses and the colon and I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call this variable time left and I'm going to set that to equals to the end time variable which is this variable here the global one so I'm setting it to equals to that minus the date time dot date time date time dot date time dot now dot, this is um, a method a time function we've imported the date time and the time module hence we're able to utilize it here and this will give us the the current time so if we take away the value of this end time from this method here it will give us the time left over for our event i have added some more line of code so as to save time so i've added this line here what this does it um, takes away the microseconds okay so if without that the time will display after the seconds it will also show, show some microseconds so I'm using this value here to take away the microseconds so that we don't have that displayed and then here I've created this is what will display the clock okay this will show the time that is left to your particular event this is what we've used to set that time and this here this piece of code here is used to trigger the countdown after 1000 milliseconds so i'm going to end this lecture here and we'll continue in part two where we'll start to build the interface for the countdown clock so make sure you save your work just click file save and uh, we'll see you in part two Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to the part two of creating a countdown timer with Python. Before I carry on, I just want to um, elaborate on some key differences between the T Kinta, this one, and the T Kinta import for the TTK. All right the difference is a lot with the widgets with the widgets in t kinter 
they are highly and easily configurable. So you have almost complete control over how they look, um, their border width, the font, the images, the color, and so on. The widgets that are controlled by TTK, they use styles to define how they look. So it takes a bit more work. If you want a non-standard button, then TTK widgets are also a little bit more, um, they are more difficult to configure. So they are both run under different types of engines. So generally speaking, the theme widgets that you, that makes your application look more elaborate and more elegant, um, you get that with TTK, but the TTK are less configurable in comparison to T Kinta. All right, let's carry on. So we're going to create say root, say root is equals to TK the TK method of function what that does it creates a root so everything that you put on the screen whether it is a text box a button or an image is referred to as a widget and they must all be placed in the root so you can think of a widget like a or the think of the root as a basket that you put all your widgets in so now that we've got the root sorted let's try and add some properties so we are going to say root dot attributes we're going to set the attributes and this is relating to the screen um, so we're going to set how we want the screen to be so you do double quote dash full screen if you want your application to be full screen then the value you have to set the value to true I want to be able to control how the screen looks so I can resize it. So I'm setting that value to false. So I want to set up the background color for the main screen. So you do root, which is the main window. So the root dot configure And inside parentheses, you type in the word background, back ground. I'm going to set the color to black. And close the parentheses. The next thing I want to do I want um, a button like this X button to be on the application and I'm going to bind that to this function here called quit. So when you click on that X, it will quit the application. So I do root dot bind and inside the parentheses for that method, I am going to do a double quote and then the X so this will be the X on the screen that you can click on and the other argument I'm going to pass in is the function called quit okay so I'm passing that into there as well next thing I want to do is call the function this um, we want to trigger the clock so we do root to act to call the timer again. So we want the timer to start again here. 
after 1000 milliseconds and we're passing the can't wait function okay so we we specified it here we're doing that again here so this is called here once the screen is activated so that's it for this um, video i we will conclude in part three in part three we are going to actually set the end date and the time for the countdown so we're going to set when we want the countdown to begin so we'll do that in part three thanks for watching I'm hello and welcome to part three of creating a countdown timer with python so we are now going to set the end date when we want the our event to end so we're now going to set up the end date so we can start counting the time so we created a global variable here called end time so i'm going to use that now so i'll say end time I'm going to set that to equals to the date time dot the date time method and inside that method in, inside in between the parentheses for this method is where I will specify when I want my event to end. So you start with the year 2017, followed by the month, is the ninth month, followed by when I want it to end. I want it to end at the end of this month, so I'll say 30th. Okay, and then you pass in zero just to format it and zero so if you have a month that doesn't end in 31 that's 30 for example if you put 31 and you know that september only has 30 days it will throw up an error so this here the first zero will represent the hours and the second zero will represent the minutes so now we've set a value for our end time variable here which is going to equal to be the date time and inside in this date time um, module we have a method called date time and we're passing it a value of the year the month the day and then the time this first zero will represent the hours and the seconds and the other one represents the sorry the first zero represent the hours and the minutes and the other zero represent the seconds we imported the font from tkinter so let's try and use that as well so to use that we are going to create a variable so here i'm going to create a variable called fnt which is short for font you could call it anything it doesn't really matter we're going to set that to font dot font and then inside the parentheses of this font method we are going to pass in several properties first we want to pass in a font family and we're going to pass in a font called Helvetica Helvetica okay and next thing we want to do we want to give the font a size so I'm going to set this to um, what shall I give I'm going to make this 90 and I want it to be bold so I'll say 
weight equals bold. Weight means how thick you want it to be. So I just set it to bold. Oops, I've got my my quote outside of the parentheses. It should be inside. To save time, I have um, completed the rest of the code here. So we've already covered this one. This is where I set the a new variable for the font and passed in these values here. This will be responsible for the size of the clock of the tick. Okay, that's the actual, that will control the size of the text on the screen. Here, I've defined a variable called text. When you define variable, you can always change the, the values. So this variable here, I've set it to equals to string var. What that means is that this will accept string values. So the values that will be passed into this variable is going to be string. And here we've got a label. And uh, here I'm using the TTK module, this one here. And the label I'm using here for the label, which is the root, which is that is the root of the application. I'm setting a text variable to equals to text. I'm setting the font to equals to this font here, the variable. The foreground color, which would be the color, not the background color, the color at the front will be white. The background will be black. And here, this here is used to position the clock on the screen. This anchor here positions it in the center. And this two here, real X and real Y, are used to um, position the X and the Y axis. And then here we've got the root dot main loop. So this keeps the application running. So this is what keeps the clock running until you exit it. So it handles the event loop. Okay, so each time the, the event loops, it handles it and it keeps the application running until the window is closed. And when the window is closed, it usually calls the quit function here and then exits the application. So that should be it. So I'm just going to save this. Make sure that you format your code just like I have. If not, the this editor here will complain. It's, it's very fussy. It likes its code to be formatted in a certain way. So if he complains, just respond by formatting the code properly. So this is it. So I'm just going to test to run the application. So I'm going to click run module. Okay, that is it. So it tells me I have 22 days left. 22 days, seven hours, 58 minutes and 53 seconds left to my event. So you can always change the value of when you want your event to end. So that's it, how you create a countdown timer in Python. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to get the computer to generate random numbers using Python. To begin, let's open up our Python idle. So you go to start or program, click on the Python folder and then click on the Python idle. And this should launch the idle. So we'll now open up a new file and go file, new file. And I like to save this file. So save it as, save as, I'll save it to my desktop. Notice it's got the right extension here, which is a Python file. So I'll just save it as random numbers and click save.
So this is a file. I'm going to save now as random numbers.py. All right. I just moved that here a little bit. Before we can generate random numbers, we're going to use a Python module called random. So Python has different modules that you can use for different things. So I'm going to use the module called random before I can use it in my program. I need to import it. So to import it, you just type in import followed by the name of the module and the name is called random. Okay. So it's now been imported. I just saved my file. I just saved. So I've not imported the module. The next thing I want to do, I want to generate some random numbers. So I need to specify a range. Okay. And I'm going to be using a for loop as well. So I just do a for, this is a loop for I, I will be the range for I in the range. And then I need to specify the range. So I save from one to say 27. Okay. So I want the computer to generate random numbers from one to 27. Next thing I need to do, I want to print it. So I type in print. And then followed by the word random dot rand int int means integer integer is a number and then i'll pass in the valuables the values so i'll go one two twenty seven okay so i'll save this and if i run this module here the computer should generate random numbers between one and 27 inside the Python shell. So I've got that saved. I'll just go run. Oh, okay. I've missed out the syntax somewhere. Let's see what's gone wrong. Oh, I didn't need the extra parentheses. That's why I need to put a colon there. I'll save that and run the module again and go run and you can see it's generated the random numbers here for me so that's how you generate random numbers using python thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this lecture we are going to create a number guessing game what will happen is the computer will generate a random number and you, the player, will try to guess what number it is. To begin, let's open up our Python idle. So we go to our programs, click on the Python folder and click on the idle. And once the idle is launched, you just open up a new file, go file, new, and we'll save this new file. We'll save it as a Python file on the desktop. I'll call it number guessing game. Okay. And click save. So we've got that saved. Okay. Because we want the computer to generate a hidden random number and then we, or you, the player have to try and guess what number the computer has generated. So you have to keep guessing until you get it right. So the module we will use to generate random number is called random. Before we can use it, we need to import it. So I'll type in import random. 
what um, we want to do as well, we want a way where all the guesses that the user makes is also stored. So when they finally guess the number right, it will display all their guesses and it will also display a report showing how many attempts it took for them to get the right answer. So to do that, we're going to create a list. A list is kind of like an array that will store the guesses. So I'm going to create it, I'll call it guesses. So this will be the list. For now, set it to an empty array. And that's how you create an array. So this is where the guesses will be stored. Okay, so I need to create a kind of uh, variable that the computer will use to store random numbers. So to do that, I'll call it my computer. And I'll set it to equals to random dot rand int. The int means integer. So this I'm telling the computer to generate random numbers and I, ha I have to specify the range of numbers. So I'll say generate random numbers from one to say, I'll make it 70. You can make it any number, it doesn't really matter. It will work for any number. So I, the computer will generate random number between one to 70. So the user will have to try and guess which number the computer has generated. So that's the variable for the computer. And then there has to be a way for the player to input the number. So to do that, we create another variable called player. And we set it to equals to integer, because they'll be entering an integer. And will also be an input. And then we specify the text. We'll say enter a number between one to 70. Okay. So we want all the guesses the player makes to be appended or added into this array here, this empty array we've created. So to do that, we need to do guesses dot append, and then we'll pass it the name of the variable, which is player. So every guess that is made, it will go into this variable, this list here called guesses. Next thing I need to do is find a way of checking um, if the number to try and help the user guess right, we need to find a way of checking if the number they have entered is either too high or too low. And uh, we're going to achieve that using a while loop. To save time, I have implemented the while loop already. I'll just explain the code to you. So this is where the while loop starts. So what this is doing is, is checking for some conditions here. So it's saying while the player, you say if the play, if while the player, the number the player selected, okay, is not equals to the computer. So the number the player has, has type 10, if that's not equals to the number the computer has secretly generated, then what it will do, it will check if the number the player, as long as this condition is true, it will check this. If the number the player has entered is greater than the number secretly generated by the computer, it will print a message saying the number is too high. 
So this will kind of like give the user a clue as to how close or far off they are to the number the computer has secretly generated. So it will print too high. However, if the number is low than the number the computer generated, if it's lower, it will print the number is too low. Again, it will start the loop again here. You notice, and here it will do the same thing as done here. It will gen it will type in any number between one to seventy in order to guess the number the computer has generated. So every guess that the player makes will be appended to the list. So the loop again starts here and the loop will keep going on until the number is guessed right. So when the number is correctly guessed, these reports will be printed or generated. It will print, you have guessed right, good job. It will also print how many guesses it took the player. And we've used this I here is the counter, is the, you know, indicator as a counter. And this is the percentage of the guesses. This here is used to identify the guesses. And the length here, here, this is the length of the guesses. So it will list all the guesses based on this length here. It will also then print these where your guesses it will print the guesses based on this and it will print all the guesses. Okay, so I'll get that saved and we'll run the module, see if that works. I'll go run module. I've got some error here, indentation. It doesn't like the indentation here. So what I need to do, I need to bring that here a bit. It's a bit fussy with indentation. So I'll go save and run it again. See if it's happy this time. It seems to be happy. So I need to enter a number between one and 70. So I go 30. So it's too high. Okay, so that's giving me a clue. I go 20, too low. So 30 is too high, 20 is too low. So it's got to be between 20 and 20, and 20 something. So I just put 25. Oh, great stuff. So I've guessed it right. It says you have guessed it right. Good job. It took you three guesses. These were your guesses. So these were my guesses. I guessed 30, 20 and 25. So that's it. So that's how you will create a number guessing game in Python. So this is the file here that we have generated. And this is the actual program. So this is what we'll run. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.